the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and we are live on Facebook and YouTube and therealnews.com. And now joining us is Larry Wilkerson. Larry was the former chief of staff for U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell. He's currently an adjunct professor of government at the College of William and Mary and a regular contributor to the Real News. Thanks for joining us again, Larry. Good to be here, Paul. The uh, serious situation. It, it was pretty clear that the United States, the Saudis, uh, and the, uh, Qatar, the Turkey, uh, all the American allies in the region, more or less, Israel, they wanted the overthrow of Assad. And, and this was a, a neoconservative agenda. The, Sa the Saudis started it. In, in my considered view, the Saudis started it. Start, and, and, and it, one of the most devastating civil wars yep. since the World the, War II. They, they began pumping the arms and eventually the foreign fighters in there. They took everybody's side, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, you name it. The Saudis were willing to back them as long as they were against Assad. And they were the instrument of our getting sucked in there, just as they're the instrument of our being sucked into Yemen. Now in its third year, brutal, deadly, bloody war, we have no business to be in, the Saudis are the instrument of our fate in the Middle East. I always thought it'd be Israel, Israel, and it may indeed still be ultimately Israel, but right now it's the Saudis. In 2015, Putin made a speech at the United Nations and he said, if the Assad regime is not protected and, and defended, it's opening the gates of hell of, of ISIS and other sorts of terrorists. Um, and the Russians started bombing, and the Russians uh, successfully uh, defended the Assad uh, government, and the Assad government is now in, in, in certainly a, a strong position, and, and there's no sign of it going anywhere. Um, this really defied U.S. foreign policy objectives, and, and the, uh, at least under the Trump administration, I think they now acknowledge that the Russians are essentially going to be the, uh, the power that's going to determine the outcome events in Syria. Um, but the foreign policy establishment does not like anyone of the United States being in a position to determine the outcome of these kinds of situations. Uh, has, has the American, uh, you know, state, other than the Trump administration, have they uh, come to terms with Syria or is this not over yet for them? I was convinced towards the end of the Obama second administration that they had reluctantly come to terms with a reduced U.S. role to include a pushing away from Saudi Arabia. The Trump administration has clearly, incoherently, but clearly in the sense that we see the initial moves like the sword dance in Riyadh, switch that policy and put us back, ostensibly back for the duration in what is truly developing to be a god awful mess in the Middle East. One that I might hasten to add, we started with our invasion of Iraq and we're still seeing the ramifications of. That said, let me back up a moment and get back to Russia. I marvel at Putin's capability, like a virtuoso, to play us. He looked at Syria and he said, this is not like Ukraine, this is not like Crimea. I do not have interior lines. I have better lines than the US, but I don't have interior lines. Um, but they still have longer lines than I do. That is to say, distance to get to the theater of battle, if you will and difficulty in moving assets. But I do have some interest in Syria. One is staying in the Middle East, and that's the only place I can do it. Two is I'm already there. I have some facilities there and I wanna protect them. And three, I'm worried about terrorists coming up into my own problems like Chechnya. And oh, by the way, my biggest reason, I think I can beat the United States at its own game and in the process be the legitimate power rather than the illegitimate power, which is what the United States has been all along. We have never had a government in Syria recognized by the United Nations and the majority of countries in the world invite us into Syria. We just went like we went into Iraq. Um, they're the legitimate power, having been asked by the legitimate government in Damascus to come and help them against ISIS and other forces that want to unseat that legitimate government. Putin is a virtuoso up against idiots, as far as I can see, in the U.S. administration. Well, I think Putin is the uh, inheritor of, product of, you know, a hundred years of experience KGB culture, which is very sophisticated. 
Oh, please, please. Go ran all the way ran, back to ran Catherine rings the Great. around the American intelligence <laughs> agencies all through the Cold War. Yeah, I, I, I said, just go all the way back to Catherine the Great or what? The, the Russians have always been, the Russians have always been better than we have at this, the short time that we've been practicing this sort of thing. How much does what's happened in Syria change the whole balance of power in the Middle East, or is it more confined to Syria? The balance of power in the Middle East, Paul, was changed dramatically when the United States changed its policy of over three plus decades and took out Saddam Hussein and destabilized Southwest Asia. The balance has not been restored by anyone since. It's been teetering back and forth. Russia's been playing with it. Iran's been playing with it. Saudi Arabia and the GCC have been playing with it. We've been playing with it from time to time. Until that balance is restored, and I think it's going to take a recognition of the principal balancer because of all manner of things, demographics, history, cohesive society, and so forth, is Iran. Until we recognize that, it's going to stay out of balance and we're going to have a mess. Right now, Putin has recognized that. And Putin has stepped in and put his foot on the scales, put Russia's foot on the scales with air power, ground power, naval power to match that foot. And while he can't match us globally, he can certainly match us in this spot on the map. And he has done so. And further, he's got Iran and Syria itself and the armed forces thereof who never did fall apart. He's got them on his side, too. So if the balance is for a moment, tentatively restored, it's because of that new coalition between Moscow, Tehran, and Damascus. The uh, coalition, I wonder how serious a coalition it is. It is in Syria, but the real agenda of the Trump foreign policy has always been to strengthen the American position in Iraq and regain what was lost in Trumpian language, which is particularly the Iraqi oil fields, and destabilize and undermine the Iranian regime uh, and with a hopeful and certainly arti over overtly articulated hope for regime change in Iran. Um, if, if that is their strategy, and I don't think it's an if, it's more an if how well they can execute on it, but this is something they say quite openly. There's nothing secret about it. But can one actually see the Russians trying to obstruct this, or is this, it was this part of the Trump deal making? I always hypothesized that Trump's deal with Putin was essentially, you have Syria, we'll get the embargo lifted and start investing in Russian energy, and you may scream when we do stuff with Iran, but you're not going to do anything serious. And, and, and could Russia do anything seriously to stop the Americans in Iran anyway? You're, you're assuming that there is some sort of collusion between Moscow and Washington, and it's based, that collusion is based expressly on the two characters. I'm not ready to buy that yet. First, because I have seen no hard evidence of it. Second, because I've had a lot of people who know the situation better than I, some of them much better than I, who've dissuaded me from it. And third, because it just doesn't comport with my idea after 50 years in public service of how things work in the world. It's too clean. It's too easy. 